All right, it's past 12, so I think we can get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining the second iteration of the um, Hopkins Business of Health Initiative Big Data series for this summer. We, um, this is the second summer that we are having this, um, these talks. And uh, this time we have our very own Dan Polsky telling us who's gonna be talking about, uh, to us about different types of uh, data that uh, he has access to and potentially others may get access to um, that um, include data on physicians, nurse practitioners, hospitals, um, and the different parts of the healthcare system. So um, Dan will be, and that's what he promised, will tell us how we can, we can uh, what the structure of the data are, what's out there, potentially what can be linked or, or, or what can be used together and what he's, uh, what he's working on. We're very excited to hear about that too. So um, then 45 minutes and uh, we're gonna have um, uh, questions. Um, if you could type your question in the chat, um, we will, um, I will be monitoring it so that we can ask Dan at appropriate times to, uh, to address a question. So if it's really burning, you can just, you know, try to interrupt. We won't shout at you for that. So thanks again, everyone for coming. Welcome. And I will pass it on to Dan. Uh, thank you, Amelia. First, uh, <clears throat> thank you to you for putting this session, set of sessions together. Um, it's been uh, great so far. Hopefully, uh, I can keep, uh, keep it up from the first one on um, Medicare Advantage data. Um, but uh, second, just uh, to thank Jamie, um, who is also on a marathon tour of, uh, of Zoom uh, webinars. And uh, so, uh, you know, with this, none of this would be possible, none of today would be possible without her and tremendous support and organization. And finally, this is a joint presentation with G. Bai. G, thank you so much for uh, sharing this uh, presentation with me. I'm going to go for about 20 minutes and turn it over to G, who will. Uh, um, you know, continue um, to talk about uh, other elements of our of our data infrastructure here. So just, I'm gonna, here's a little agenda for the next 40 minutes or so. We're gonna keep this informal. Um, so feel free to use the chat or, or even, you know, I think there's like 30, some of us. So I think it's even, at, at, if there's, you know, burning questions, don't hesitate to just turn on your, your microphone and ask your question. So we'll start just a little motivation here for focusing on data on providers. And I'm really gonna try to zoom on in on this commercial data set we have available, one key, and talk about the ins and outs of that, but you know, compare it to free data that uh, can do some of the same thing. And then I'll go through some uh, a, a short research presentation on how I've, the importance of having a good registry um, from one key. And then I'll turn it over to G who will talk about the hospital transparency rule um, and uh, and talk about an exciting new data set, set from Turquoise on, on hospital um, prices and talk about her research she's doing. So that'll take us through uh, the next 40 minutes or so. So just to dive in a little intro here um, and you know, there's lots of ways to motivate using these data. This is just a one um, and it's really focused on this role of providers and how they're organized. Uh, and what data we have to really think about uh, provider organization, whether it's in, in providers like the most general of terms, it's almost too general to be, it's just annoying. Um, we're referring to both providers, uh, like individual providers of care, but also organizations that provide care. Um, and there's a lot of integration among hospitals, uh, among physicians and physician groups, between hospitals and physician groups, and even into downstream uh, post-acute care uh, settings. Um, and uh, what gets really tricky uh, with this consolidation, it's implemented not only through traditional ways where they kind of, you know, there's multiple hospitals are all part of the same organization. It's really under understandable the boundaries of the organization. But there are also so many arrangements, joint ventures, affiliated agreements, clinical integrated networks, there's very loose ties that happen between providers. So mapping out the uh, importance of different um, ways of organization becomes really difficult because there's no single definition. 
Um, yet these questions are of burning interest, both to uh, policymakers, but also to, to uh, you know, uh, I guess business, people who are trying to figure out uh, uh, how to organize businesses and organizations um, in this space. Um, and, and, and there's so many unanswered questions and a lot of that has to do with the limitations of the existing data. So, you know, the goal here is, you know, we should be at the forefront here. We should be experts of the you know, latest and greatest data and try to make it even better through the linkages and how we work together um, to, to, bring, uh, to bring information uh, to address these really burning questions. And so ultimately one of the reasons it's such a burning question here is that you know, the argument for consolidation is it promotes efficiency, reduced costs, increases coordination. It's like you know, I'm an apple pie, it's just the greatest thing ever. Um, but you know, when you look at the research that's out there, um, there's really no question that consolidation increases costs. But what we, we aren't certain of is on the quality side. Uh, some research shows that um, you know, it could maybe improve it in certain circumstances, coordination outweighs the, um, you know, the kind of size and lack of competition that may inhibit quality. And so you know, the, the directionality even theoretically could go in either direction. Um, and so you know, it's kind of that, that classic more research is needed. And really to do that, we really need to um, have the data to be able to do that. So that's my little motivating piece. So let's talk about one key. Um, this is a, a data product of IQVIA, which is a healthcare data company, tries to make a lot of money selling data. Um, and so this data one key, it seeks, this is their, their terminology, seeks comprehensive coverage and insights. They love that word insights for all providers who deliver care to patients. Um, the challenge uh, of uh, kind of just diving into one key is just accepting it as reality. Uh, if you talk to them about how they bring all their data together, it's some combination of web scraping, kind of kind of on the on the kind of advanced side. Practices are changing all the time. They're really learning from you know kind of monitoring uh, how practices are presenting themselves on the web. Uh, they do telephone confirmation of the data that they find. And then I think what really makes these data, you know, um, different than other sources is they have this primary data collection element on web scraping and telephone confirmation, but they combine it with all the data that exists in other parts of uh, IQVIA where they have all the medical claims. And so they kind of identify, they both identify in the front end how organizations are evolving uh, through the medical claims, but also confirm what they find through more primary data collection of telephone confirmation and web scraping. And they combine it with some of the more traditional industry and government sources that we'll also talk a little bit about today. So this is again their slide here, uh, but this is a, a key way to think about what these data offer. On uh, the left-hand side here, um, their data include all sites of care, types of supporting patient journey is what they say, but you know, basically hospitals, you know, nursing homes, any organization that delivers care. Uh, so think of that as like, that could be like a flat file, every organization. And then they also have all professionals that uh, deliver care supporting the patient journey, but essentially anyone who's billing for services, that's an individual uh, provider. Um, think of that as a really long flat file. And so what they also have is uh, this arrow between them uh, includes the relationships between professionals with their sites of care. So any professional, let's take a physician, might have a relationship with multiple sites of care. They are part of a physician practice. They uh, you know, maybe have a research office, that's even usually in the data. And then they um, are an attending at like the main hospital and maybe they have uh, uh, visits that they do and they, they or they you know, see patients at three or four other hospitals. So they, all those uh, relationships would be listed and you'd have all the organizational data for each site of care that's connected to the professional provider. Then you can also see, because you have that list of professionals that are tied to every organization, the full list of providers that are part of every organization. 
and just kind of flip the file by organization and, and sort it by all the providers within that organization. So uh, when, I hope that somewhat makes sense when you talk to the salespeople at one key, it never makes sense. So maybe I'm like a salesperson at one key and I'm also not making a lot of sense because it's really a relational database that kind of can pull from lots of other databases. And as a, as a simple researcher in, in, in their 50s, I think about flat files um, and there's a way to kind of uh, communicate what these data offer from like a flat file perspective. You just think of the hierarchy of providers connected to all their organizations or organizations connected to all their providers. And that's kind of the, the bottom line of what this data set offers. So uh, this is kind of the, the 30,000 foot view. This is kind of the potential of accessing these data. It's not the data that we have, which I'll tell you in the next slide, but they have what they say, 10 million health professionals, 1.1 uh, million uh, MDs and DOs, advanced nurse practitioners, physician assistants, psychologists, nurses on down the line, all listed there, and about 700,000 healthcare organizations. About half of them are made up of outpatient centers, but includes hospitals, correctional facilities, emergency rooms, or insurance, pharma, residential, on down the line. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time there because we don't have all those data. What we, per, uh, this is another way of showing all the relationships. Oh my goodness. But the important point here is that um, there are, they actually have a third layer on the one key data. All the, the, the like practitioners are the blue on the bottom. And then they have what they call um, uh, a class of a class of service or something like that. Maybe I'm getting that a little wrong, whether you're a clinic or a hospital. Um, but then they have like this parent organization. So if you're uh, like a corporate, you know, like let's take, um, you know, some Catholic hospital system that has like 500 hospitals, the green are each of the hospitals. But then you know that those three, 500 hospitals all sum up to the same, you know, Catholic hospital organization. So there's uh, this kind of third layer, which they call the parent organization, the corporate parents, um, which I think can add other dimensions to being able to study these data. Um, so what data do we have here at Hopkins? Uh, what, what we've uh, purchased from, from one key are all the entire registry for 2019 of all MDs and DOs on their file, plus all what we asked for was nurse practitioners and physician assistants, about 0.4 million of those. So we have 1.5 million uh, providers uh, from 2019, and we have all we asked for all the health organizations that these providers are connected to. Hierarchical data set uh, for each provider, it could list like five or six different organizations. I think uh, the, the median or the, the mean is like three or three or three and a half organizations per provider. If I had to do it all over again, and the thing is, when you ask for data from them, like they don't tell you what you should ask for. I should have asked for all nurse practitioners. I mean, all advanced practice nurses. So I'm missing out on like um, uh, some uh, like, you know, if you're not called an NP, I didn't get you, even if you are, are do advanced practice and um, you know, you'll learn, live and learn. So what do these data have? Um, includes uh, age, sex, specialty address um, and the organizational ties of all the providers so is kind of provider specific organization. But then we have all on the organizations, physician staffing, patient volume, payer participation, like do they participate in Medicare or Medicaid? Actually, for the individual providers, we also have uh, payer participation in terms of Medicare and Medicaid. Hospital ownership, system membership, and, and you can kind of triangulate to, you know, really try to get a sense of uh, vertical and horizontal integration, but they don't have variables that say, like, this is their contractual relationship. Um, which, uh, which, which then you, know, you, you have to kind of induce or deduce, I guess, um, some of these relationships it's not explicitly stated because like I said at the outset, there can be um, a number of different types of contractual relationships and some of those are actually are, you know, very difficult and more proprietary. 
So what license do we have? Uh, basically anyone who's part of HBHI uh, are really, you know, it's a Hopkins specific license. Um, the challenge, so, so, you know, everyone has access to these data and they're not cheap, um, but the, the stipulation that we have in our contract is two years we have the data. So all data must be destroyed when the license expires. And I think they gave me a good deal. So, you know, I got the data for one year for $20,000 talk to other people who, you know, everyone in their own universities go, you know, Polsky's got the data, like, you know, how did you get it? And I give them the salespeople and, and no one gets that good a deal. Like some colleagues of mine have, you know, they, they try to sell the data for like 70 or $80,000. Um, so, you know, the pricing is a very strange thing. Uh, it's a two-year license. And, and, you know, so what I'm afraid of is I go back and I say, you know, we want to extend our license. And I'll say, well, they extend it. It's like, you know, twice the amount or something like that. But I, our goal is to keep these data fresh. And so we, I think, got a better deal because we asked for 2019. If we asked for 2021, it might be three or four times as expensive. Um, but ideally, we'll start to build, you know, a longitudinal picture um, over time and be able to maintain these licenses. But, you know, some of the agreements that we, you know, can kind of maintaining this over the long haul is yet, yet to happen explicitly, if you need these data, we can, we really need to find a way to keep them in one place so that we can turn off the file on January 2023. So it's one restriction, otherwise you're free to use the data. Um, so, you know, basically what we have in our data, you know, there's tons of organizational types, but the main ones for the providers that we have are hospitals and outpatient centers. We have almost all nursing homes and, uh, and other residential facilities as well. And then you see things like correctional facilities and things like that, but it's not like a full picture of some of those organizations. Um, so what we're doing is building kind of supplemental files because what is really, you know, kind of the key linchpin here is that you have NPI, you have the National Provider Identifier. So any other data that is National Provider Identifier can be linked to these data. Um, so we're trying to kind of build out uh, you know, a set of utilities that make these files, you know, more, more accessible. And one of the utilities that we've done is their specialty listing is quite extensive, actually. It lists like 200 some specialties. Sometimes you want to see like specialty groups. So we've developed our own specialty grouping, like 50 major specialty types or six specialty categories. So we have these crosswalks that we can make available for people who are using these data. Um, it's 1.1 million physicians, but if you're interested in active uh, physicians that are like delivering outpatient care um, and like, you know, for, for the work I do, it's like who is really uh, an important provider from the perspective of a insurance company that's building out a provider network. It might not be the provider in a correctional facility or some, you know, insurance company. It's providers that are delivering direct patient care and contracting with insurance companies um, for the care that they, uh, that they deliver. So we have some codes that remove residents, physicians, and types of organizations that don't do direct patient care that drops us from like the 1.1 million to maybe, you know, seven or 800,000 physicians. Um, and then, you know, a challenge here that, that we're currently having is it doesn't document all types of relationships. Um, you know, like clinic, clinic we have some uh, like practice affiliation, clinical integrated networks and ACOs, but, you know, not others. And, you know, we're interested in questions related to private equity, for example, and we'd have to pull those data from other places and collect it ourselves. So I'm not going to really spend too much time on this, I guess, but it's just, you know, the basis for a lot of this comes from these public sources that you can just go right online and download. And one of those is the National Plan and Provider Enumeration System, uh, or the NPPES. Um, this is a file that really was created when they uh, developed the system of NPIs, National Provider um, uh, uh, Identifiers. Um, so every provider is going to bill for services, needs an NPI. Usually you can get them even when you're in residency. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you have your NPI and you kind of keep it for life, presumably. Uh, and these data sets are, are updated every month, but if you're a provider, and maybe some people on the line can tell me uh, who are providers, you might not necessarily go online and keep uh, your, your information on this system up to date every time you have a different address or take some advanced certification and, and kind of 
develop a change in your specialty or something like that. Um, or maybe you stop practicing altogether. So um, there's been challenges with keeping these data up to date, um, but that's changing over time. Um, I guess I should say that any entity, so again, it's this distinction between what we call type one, individual practitioners, and type two organizations. They both have NPIs. Um, so both of those types of organizations are listed in this data set. Um, but so this, this updating, I always say these data are, are crap, um, but uh, I think CMS is endorsing this as a, as a useful data set and they're trying to make it easier for providers to update it. So you, you're not required to update it, but, um, but there is this attestation of the accuracy of the data and you're able to go in and say, I last looked at my data and I attest that it's accurate. So you can see on the file, uh, those uh, records where the providers have said, I attest of its accuracy within the past year, for example. And that's the extent we know these are great data. The other data set I just wanna bring up quickly here is Physician Compare um, National Downloadable File. Um, uh, this is really amazing for doctors and clinicians that participate in Medicare. Um, and so like one key, it links physicians to multiple group affiliations and, and multiple addresses contains uh, sex, age, and specialization, also medical school, which is not on the one key file. The nice thing about that over one key is it's free. Um, it's complete for providers that accept Medicare. Um, it uses this kind of underlying file called PICOS, which is really the way they keep track and make sure they bill and like avoid fraud within Medicare. Um, and it tries to keep it up to date with active providers. So the, the challenges here is it's not so great if you're not participating in Medicare. So pediatricians, psychiatry, a few other specialist, uh, specialist types are less likely to participate in Medicare. Um, and some of the recording of organizations are not that great and they don't necessarily, everything that's on this kind of underlying data set called PICOS doesn't necessarily get transferred onto the physician compare data set. So uh, some groups have tried to overcome that and make some publicly available data sets such as the compendium of US health systems, tries to bring together not only the data that's kind of in the underlying engine here of PICOS, uh, but brings it with this IRS form 990, which has more detailed data on um, provider organizations, but it's focused on nonprofits. Um, and a lot of this about how organizations are, or, are, are kind of organized under these systems is based on what's called the TIN the tax identification number, it's how organizations bill. Um, so if you're like a physician working for a physician group, your physician group would bill under the, the organizational TIN of the physician group. Different organizations organize their TINs differently. Some organizations have multiple TINs um, and some, you know, and other organizations uh, have a single TIN when maybe they should be billing under multiple TINs. So there's, there's some like variation there and it gets, to be, um, you know, a bit, you know, anyway, there's some challenges with that file and I think that's all I'll say there. Uh, and I'm starting to speed up here because I'm using all my time and I don't wanna uh, use all of G's time as well. Um, but just kind of as, as a summary here, we have about, we have the 1.1 million physicians. Uh, it's the same amount you get in NPPES and, and we do some adjustments to drop to 800,000 in the one key data Physician compares about 600,000 active physicians. Um, and then when you compare the NPIs across these files, there's always like an 80 or 90. So you're never gonna get the same phys physicians even if you think you uh, should. I would suggest that there's always some error in each of these data sets. And I really don't have time to do my little uh, 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 research presentation. Uh, it's kind of my, my, my latest work, uh, which I've been doing, and we talked a little bit about uh, provider networks. And I think that kind of match of one key with provider networks offers a lot of opportunities. So I set out, uh, I've been doing this work for a long time. And my latest question is, you know, if you think of the ACA marketplace, um, it's been around for seven or eight years, how is it maturing? And I want to look at that in terms of provider networks of so the plans being sold in the marketplace, uh, being sold with narrower and narrower provider networks. Or uh, is that is that um, you know broadening, or how do networks evolve over time? So I link the Veracred data, which we talked about at the last session, which I could talk more about if I had more time, which lists every every NPI 
Uh, so every physician or every, yeah, every NPI attached to every single plan sold, whether it's in the marketplace, the data I'm talking about today, but we have it for Medicare Advantage, we have it for Medicaid um, and, and potentially other uh, insurance segments as well. So we use the one key as a common denominator to do this comparison. And here what we're looking at in this study is trends over time. So it's really nice to have a stable denominator with a well-reported and validated addresses and specialties because we know, you know, one of the things about these insurance lists is that they're notorious for having very poor uh, reporting of specialties and uh, addresses. So we just kind of junk all that and use one key as kind of a stable denominator. So essentially what I'm studying here is this unit, this uh, measurement called network breadth, which is physicians in a network in a particular county divided by the physicians that could potentially see patients potentially be in a network in those counties. And so uh, the average network breadth on in the, AC, in the AC marketplace is about 42% of physicians across all counties. It's lower for HMOs, what we call EPOs, and then it's higher for uh, PPOs and point of service. And I think I'm just gonna end on this slide to leave some time here. This shows how uh, plan types have evolved over time. This line that's going up are EPOs, which have a network breadth here uh, pretty low, 42. And HMOs have gone up in the early years and have stayed pretty steady over time. And what's gone down are the broadest networks like PPOs. So there's been a trend down in network size um, over time. And most of it is the move from PPOs into HMOs. But we also find when we look at the exact data rather than kind of simulate it based on change in plan type, that there's other things going on. And the other thing that's going on is the new entrance in the past two years has been tons of new entry into the ACA marketplace and new entrants tend to be narrower plans. So I kind of rushed through that, but I want to leave time for questions and for G to go. So I am uh, going to turn it over to her and we can and take questions at the end, but I'm just going to stop for a second and so, in case someone has a point of question for me. All right, G, it's all yours. I'm going to stop share so you can share and advance slides on your own. Is that Sound good? It sounds great. Thank you so much, Dan. All right. All right. Thank you, Dan, again, for giving me this great opportunity. And thank you all for your time and attention today. So uh, my job here is to present you with a new data source we obtained uh, just recently regarding the hospital price transparency rule. Okay, so let me start with the introduction of the background. January 1st this year, all US community hospitals must disclose the, the following items um, according to the hospital press transparency rule. The first thing is a machine readable file that has payer specific negotiate the price, lease the price, and the cash price. Okay, three things, negotiate the price, the charge master lease the price, and the cash price for all the services they provide. Second, hospitals also must have a consumer friendly display of the same price information, the three things, the cash price, lease the price, payer specific, negotiate the price for 300 shoppable services. So how do we define 300? The CMS has specified 70 shoppable services. So every hospital should disclose those 70 and then the remaining 230 are up to hospitals to decide. So whatever you think is shoppable, you should put there. Then recently, you know, July 9th, the White House issued an executive order to support this price transparency rule, which was developed under the Trump administration. The last week, the CMS, you know, following this executive order, proposed to increase the annual penalty for non-compliance from before it's only $300 a day, so that equivalent to about $100,000 a year, that's before. 
But now after this July 19th proposed rule, we don't know if it will be realized or not, but according to the proposal, the penalty can be up to $2 million a year for large hospitals. So that is the background for the hospital transparency rule. So Turquoise Health uh, is a data service company that use standardized and automated you know, machine learning techniques to scan each hospital's website to extract the price information they disclose in compliance to this hospital price transparency rule. So in turquoise data, we can only see the machine readable thing. Okay, the turquoise data has no ability to extract the information for the consumer friendly display. Why? Because uh, it's just not machine readable. In order to get the information, individuals, consumer must input their insurance plan, you know, insurance number. So that is not doable from turquoise perspective. So all they have is this machine readable file that contains list price, negotiate the price, cash price for all services provided by each hospital. Okay, so what do we have here in the turquoise data? The first thing is the hospital identifier. So they have hospital ID, which is provider ID. So you can easily link that ID to hospital cost report, which you know, is a mandatory filing for all the certified Medicare certified hospitals in the United States. And you can also use that to link to AHA survey, American Hospital Association survey. You know, both the cost reports and the AHA survey have all the financial and operational information at the hospital level. And in turquoise data also already has the name and location of individual hospital. Then obviously the data has commercial negotiate the price for specific plan. This is important for specific plan. The plan name might be specified differently across hospitals but the plan name is there um, in the data set. Then we have cash price uh, and chart master list price. Then we have procedure code, you know, CPD code, a DRG code, and then we have plan name and type. So what do we mean by type? Let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicare plan, Medicare Advantage. So that's, that's all uh, as detailed as whatever is disclosed by the hospital. So turquoise data, you know, the turquoise is a startup. It's quite a new company. Its credibility has not yet been established in the academic literature, but it has been used by the Wall Street Journal and the NPR. So what you're looking at here is a January Wall Street Journal story. So at that time, we just implemented this hospital price transparency rule and the Wall Street Journal asked how to find the cost, right? And then they listed turquoise website in that story. So um, it's not surprising because Turquoise, you know, to my knowledge, is really the front runner in terms of scanning, in terms of comp um, comprehensiveness of their data. Last month, this is um, in June, Wall Street Journal has another story, compared the cash price and they negotiate the price uh, with commercial health plans for some common procedure. And they found, you know, uh, some results, and again, they use the turquoise data. So this month, July 2nd, the NPR story, so, you know, the hospitals you know, doing all, all these disclosure and the price level, and again, they use the turquoise data. So, so far, it seems like from the media market, turquoise data has already gained advantage over other competitors. So now let me uh, take some time to talk about how we can use the turquoise data um, for our research purpose. So these are the number one, I have four examples. They're all pretty straightforward. The first one is to use their compliance data. So turquoise has their self-designed compliance rating for every hospital from one to five. I won't uh, you know, spend your time to talk about the details, but basically number five is, is, is the best compliance. Not number one is the lowest com com with no compliance. So this is a map uh, drawn based on hospitals 
compliance level. And the green, the green color uh, means better compliance and the pink color means low compliance. You can see this is a compliance um, map landscape in the United States. And then we can use the data to look at the state level. So top five states, these states top five have the highest compliance rate and the bottom five, okay, bottom five states have the lowest compliance rate. That's the average across all the hospitals in that state. Or we can look at HR level or MIC level. These are a geographic region, right? Whatever you want to define, because you have the hospital location information, you can design whatever the, the standard you want to use. So here we use HR hospital referral region as defined by Datamus Atlas. So these are hospital referral regions that have zero compliance, meaning no hospital in that region uh, complied in any way. And then we have this, uh, these referral regions that have full compliance. Every single hospital in that region at least disclosed the commercial rate. Just some yeah. example. So from this yeah. first example, you know, we can use turquoise data, just the turquoise data, nothing else, right? To show the substantial variation in compliance status. Yeah, can I interrupt you for a second? There's, please, a, there's, a, there's a question from, from yeah. Joe. Um, yes. He's asking if the data contain procedure J codes for physician administered drugs. Um, um, so thank you, Joe. That's a great question. Unfortunately, no. Um, these are mostly facility costs for, for you know, the hospitals. I, I, I don't think they have, they have drugs. I, at least I haven't seen that. And the hospitals, they, strategically disclose information. So for example, hospitals only, one hospital only disclose 100 procedures. They don't really follow the 300 or, or even you know, full uh, set of procedures. And then they, they usually don't disclose drugs, at least to this point. However, things might change as we have seen from the executive order, right? Now we have the penalty. It seems like the administration is pushing to full compliance. If that happens, then Joe, I believe that the drug has to be disclosed because that belongs to the services and procedures done by the hospital. Great question, thank you. And 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 Gay, I have a I have another follow up question yes. actually based on your the map and the uh -huh. um, the, the the table that you showed before. It it, uh -huh. it looks like the both the highly compliant and the non compliant are concentrated in some states. So, um, you know, if you, if you look like, it seems like pretty much everyone in Northern Michigan is, is, is compliant and pretty much mm -hmm. nobody in Florida is compliant. So is, is this, do you have a sense of whether this correlates with some sort of state policies or something on the state level or local level that may be in addition to the federal policy that, that may be making it worse or easier um, to, to, to comply? Great question. Thank you, Emilia. Actually, we stand uh, with some other colleagues. We have a working paper talking about the factors associated with the initial compliance. Uh, we did not find any strong evidence uh, to explain, but there are definitely variations, but we haven't found any strong uh, uh, reasons except for this peer effect. Seems like it's clustering, right? If, if some hospitals in one place is clothing, then then the, the peer hospitals will have to, under the peer pressure, disclose. Yeah, that's what we found. But other than that, I, I, I think the, the evidence is not very strong. Thank you, Amelia. Okay, um, so second example, this again, only using turquoise data. Okay, so we can look at the level of the negotiated price. So I give you here only the radiology services. Remember, the CMS has 70 specified shockable, shockable services that every hospital must disclose. So among the 70 shockable services, there are 13 radiology services. Okay, so here we list them. And then we can, you know, from the turquoise data, this is last month, but probably middle of last month. So the number of hospitals are the, whatever is available. Um, I, should, I should not say that, I should say, um, the hospitals, according to turquoise, has disclosed the, the negotiate the price with commercial plans for that specific code. 
So you can see the number of hospitals defer, right? Uh, varied across procedure. And then the state means they these hospitals are dispersed among how many states? So it's, a, it's pretty well represented in terms of number of states. Then we have the Medicare rate. This is just the Medicare statutory uh, becoming the rate. Then we have the relative price. Relative price simply means the median negotiate the price for that specific service divided by the Medicare rate. So you know, almost six times for the CT scan of head and only two times for the mammography of both breasts. So, so there's variation in terms of the gap between negotiate the price and the Medicare rate. Then we can look at the IQR, we can look at the you know, maximum, minimum, you know, how, however you wanna design. So that is you know, showing, just using turquoise data, we can show substantial variation in the median negotiate the price across the CMS specified shoppable radiology services. The number three is cash, so a cash price. The cash price is also disclosed by any, many hospitals. Again, I'm using radiology services as an example. So these are the number of hospitals disclosed both the cash price and the commercial negotiated price, okay? Because here the goal is to compare the cash price and the negotiated price to see which one's higher. The median cash price, IQR, is straightforward. And here is percentage with cash price smaller, the lower than at least the one commercial price. So how many hospitals have their cash price smaller than at least the one commercial price? So we have almost three, three quarters of hospitals, okay? And here the percentage of cash price smaller than all commercial price, all commercial price. It's about you know, between 7% and even 15%. Hospitals said their cash price lowest. Then here, percentage of cash price exactly the same as the minimum commercial price. So we have two or three percent. So together, if you look at the, the right-hand side, the two columns combined together, it's about you know, 15%, right? 15% hospitals set the cash price the lowest. So what's the you know, interpretation? Many hospitals set, set their cash price comparable or lower than the commercial negotiate the price to attract price sensitive customers. And the commercial insurance plans do not necessarily always get the lowest the price for hospital services compared to cash pay patients. All right, so last example. So, so far, the first three examples, we only use the turquoise data. So here we can link, right, turquoise data with other hospital operational and financial factors obtained from the Medicare cost report or HA survey. So we look at the uh, colonoscopy, which is considered the most shoppable service, right? Because everybody, according to this year's new guideline, every American over the age of 45 should get the screening. So here is the, all the 1,100 disclosing hospitals as of end of June. So they disclosed their colonoscopy price and we got the median negotiated price and we draw this histogram. So we, we call the high price hospitals, you know, are the hospitals that have the high median uh, negotiate the price at least the $5,000. Remember, the Medicare rate is only 800. So if you have the median negotiate the price for commercial plans at 5,000, that's like um, six times, right? <laughs> Over six times higher than the Medicare rate. Then we can link, this is from cost report, link the, the uh, hospital ownership. That, that's one of my uh, research interests, hospital ownership. So we can see in the high price hospitals, those have well, at least 5,000 the price versus the remaining hospitals. We see more for-profit hospitals, right? We see fewer government and we see fewer non-profit hospitals. Then keep going, we can compare those very common characteristics like median bed, median number of plans, you know, profit margin, chart markup, you know, Rural you know, location or, or teaching status. But the overall conclusion is that the high price hospitals you know, might have strong profit motivation because they're more likely to be for profit and they have a higher charge markup. They are being more aggressive in billing and the greater negotiating leverage um, with insurance plans. So 
in terms of their number of plants. So that's interpretation, very descriptive work. But my goal is to show you that we have a lot of potential to use the turquoise data in combination with other hospital financial and operational factors. But the turquoise data has many limitations, right? The number one, this is the commercial data set, very new, has not yet been established in the academic literature. Second, we have a very low and evolving compliance rate. So whatever you do today might change dramatically third, three, four weeks from now, especially given so many uh, policy actions uh, in, the, in the run. Um, the last one is the low comparability. So what do we mean? Let's say you want to look at the specific plan, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for, for Medicare Advantage, then the coding, if you look at the hospital's disclosure, they might code differently. And, and that is not um, under any regulatory you know, oversight. So hospitals can disclose whatever they want in, in how they code the plan. So that creates a lot of challenges for researchers who want to you know, look at the plan level information. But overall, you know, um, we have this data set and it's uh, thanks to the, the support from Annual Adventures. So the Annual Adventures gives us a, a grant to support this work that use turquoise data. And also we have the support from HBHI. Um, so uh, I think, you know, this, this data definitely has potential, especially in the long run. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jay. Um, questions for G or Dan? I have a question. Um, the turquoise data set, they say they have an, they'll allow an academic license. Um, does that license apply to all investigators at Hopkins or does it um, have to be, do we have to apply Oh, um, we have the access. So I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Just uh, let Dan know or, or Jamie know and, and we can share the access. It's, it's straightforward, it's use SQL. And, and, and from what, what I learned, it's, it's really straightforward. And the data is easy to work with. Okay. So Hopkins okay. Y, okay. Uh, Thank you. DUA, right? For anyone connected to Hopkins, the DUA is, is across Hopkins, is that right? Yes, this this you know this Hopkins license. So anyone um, who's in the hospital, never sorry, not in the hospital, in the Hopkins, uh, definitely should have access to this. Yeah, out of curiosity, they didn't say any pricing for the data set. Does it does it cost uh, to license that data set? Yes, it does cost. Mm -hmm. But but you know they give us the uh, academic discount, and also you know we played a major role in how. Um, <laughs> You know, the initial coverage of Wall Street Journal made a huge difference in their business. And now they got millions and millions of funding. But, but we, Hopkins, you know, me and colleagues, we, we played a role in how, how that um, turquoise got placed in that story. Okay. So, because we got a good deal, but you know, that's, that's why we, we have good access to their data. Thank you. Yeah. I have a good question. So, uh, is this mandatory? So, like, is there any kind of reporting cycle every year, like a January through February, or things like that? That's a great question. My understanding is turquoise updating the data constantly. It's a it's a machine learning uh, platform. So, if there's change, the machine's gonna detect it, but it's not instantly. So, the review takes a cycle. It seems like a, a week. So, they're going through. And also the problem they have about 800, six, you know, six to 800 hospitals that uh, whose machine readable file is not actually readable. So turquoise have to use some you know, human power to go there to extract. So that means the data is not 100% matchable to the cost report due to those unreadable hospitals. But the update I would say, although it's not instant, but it's already much better than most other companies I'm aware of. So it is possible that they, the, the, the price changes you know, within a year, right? This January. Yes, year. absolutely, absolutely. But you know, in general, hospitals do not change the price within the contracting year, right? So, so if they want to change the price, they have to wait after this term expires. 
but as you said, you know, they, they can definitely change the, the, the price um, under, under you know, any circumstances. But the more important question actually is disclosure. Now we are trying to get the screenshot, let's say end of July, end of August, before the exact award, after exact award, see how things changed. The compliance issue is easier to tackle. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask a self-serving one, self-serving self question because I'm interested in this. Um, have you looked at the Maryland data yet and do all payers pay the same at hospitals as we would expect given the all payer system? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Uh, yes. So how uh, Maryland hospitals they disclose the, the price range is very, very small, almost non-existent. Yeah. Like how can our own disclosure, all plans have the exact same rate. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, I'll ask a question to you about, um, well, I, I think, I, I fear I already know the answer to this, but do, do you know if there's any distinction between self-funded versus fully funded plans in the data? Um, given that we think in theory that they might actually be priced differently in, in certain markets? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. But to my knowledge, most hospitals don't disclose that, that, mm -hmm. that you know, detailed uh, information. If the carrier is Blue Cross, they would just say Blue Cross. Right, right. Yeah, they, you, it's hard for, for us to find out is that really self-funded or it's just, uh, you know, as a... As a, a mm -hmm. Um, unless it's a, a single uh, administrative carrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. And then another question is, do, do we have an early sense of how um, possible will be to like link these data to, for instance, the DRG interstudy enrollment data? Um, maybe maybe Dan has a, has a sense of this. You, can can we th think about insurer market power? Uh, is yeah, uh, so um, G's, she has an amazing RA that she's bringing on, um, and I'm working with her to uh, link, you know, with with all our data on plans and carriers, um, to the, you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, uh, Turquoise has cleaned up the data, so like, you know, it'll just say like Aetna. Right. Um, right. There's no code, you know, and um, it says a lot of. It's going to be some heavy lifting to come to really have reliable linkages. But what's nice is, you know, they do have a code for whether it's commercial, an MA, a Medicaid plan. So, you know, Edna would be listed for all the plan types within each provider. So uh, we're probably thinking very similar. But yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're doing some real heavy lifting on, on that at the moment. That's great. Yeah, I think that'll be really valuable. The, uh, if I may jump in, the risk here now uh, is that the things are really moving fast. So, so I think especially for our doctoral students who are interested in this, um, we might want to wait a little bit, especially given the high penalty, right? So maybe later this year when we have a meaningful proportion of hospitals complying, then, then we can move on. You know, just last week, there's was a Washington Post story using a a, a white paper showing the compliance rate is only 5%. But so that means full compliance. Turquoise, the compliance standards are actually very low. See, as long as you disclose the commercial negotiated price, I give you full compliance. But if you really dig into the details of the rule, then only like fewer than 5% of US households have complied as of now. But you know, developing the machinery to answer questions when, you know, uh, you know, instead of being 1,800 hospitals, it's up to 3,000 hospitals. You know, once that like new tranche shows up at 3,000, we're ready to go. Um, you know, that, like now, the time is now to work with these data. Um, just might not be the time to, to you know, right. for a few months to publish. Then you get an update of the data before you publish. But then I have a quick question on the uh, regarding the one key data. So we have you said you we have 2019 data, right? Then is there any chance that you get like it, uh, uh, the data for earlier years, like 2018 or 2017? So uh, thanks for asking that question. So uh, one key, this one key product is a new product. Um, 
they bought out this other company called SKNA. Uh, I have, you know, from like pen licenses, SKA data back to like 2006. Uh, probably, you know, the, the licenses are very weak. Like, it's hard to know exactly what exactly I can use and what I can. And then they stopped doing providing it. I think I have it through like 2016 or something, and maybe some other file in 2019. So I have like this historical file, but it's not under kind of what I would feel comfortable with under active licenses. On those kind of data, we could think about purchasing. Uh, any study I've done using those data that are longitudinal in nature, um, and I find something strange, and I call up the people at SKNA and say, like, why did this jump by 20%? They're like, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. We hired twice as many people to do phone calls and ask about that question, and we got this incredible response rate. It's the greatest ever. Well, I don't think. That's a real finding then. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I would say I'd like to keep the data set up to date, um, but I would caution against unless we really figure out kind of the, the science behind how they collect these data, uh, just the noise of changes over time. There might be more noise than signal if you're thinking of studying, doing longitudinal studies. Just a word of warning, like hard learned. Uh, but it kind of depends too on the variables you're interested in. But I'd be happy to explore that with you for potentially develop a you know, more longitudinal series. All right. Um, thanks, Nan and G. Great discussion, everyone. It's um, it's always uh, it's always interesting to hear about new and and evolving data sets and all the stories around how things are changing and what's going on. But um, it's uh, it's great that you gave us the, the primer on these two um, or more. Um, and if anyone has any follow-up questions, suggestions, ideas, research ideas, please feel free to reach out to Dan and to G. This is, uh, that's the purpose of the seminar so we can connect people and generate ideas, put our heads together on what else can be done. And of course, highlight what we are already doing in um, the Business of Health Initiative. So, um, a round of applause, one more, one more for for the for presenters. It's been a long day for uh, many of you, I know. So, thank you for for sticking around, and um, and we hope to see you again in the next um, the next iteration of the Big Data Seminar in um, in August. So, thank you, Amelia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good thank one. You. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.